Hi guys, my name is Gavin Hewitson. I'm the founder of Inbox. I'm an email marketing consultant and I'm on the online prosperity show. Today we are going to be talking about everything and anything email marketing for direct to consumer brands. Email is an absolute beast when it comes to generating revenue. And if you want to learn how you can develop meaningful connections with your subscribers, as well as to grow the size of your database and to generate sales and conversions from that database, you've come to the right place. Listen in, let us know if you have any questions. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show, the show that brings you expert insights and strategies to help, especially today, e-commerce businesses thrive. And today I'm uh, joined by Gavin, who is an email marketing strategist and the founder of a company called Inbox. Gavin, how are you doing today? I'm fantastic, Prosper. Thank you for asking. Fantastic. Now, obviously, uh, most of us are you know, running an online business and some of it has to do with uh, e-commerce where we are trying to reach our audiences and sell our products. Okay. So sometimes email marketing can just be one of those trickiest things to get it right, but we know that we need it. And in this episode, we're going to be discussing maybe the latest trends and the best practices in e-commerce marketing, um, especially when it comes to email and how Online businesses and e-commerce businesses can use email campaigns to to build stronger relationships with their customers and they can boost their brand awareness and ultimately drive more sales. So whether you're a seasoned e-commerce marketer or just starting out, you don't want to miss this insightful conversation with Gavin. And you also don't want to go in a staring uh, competition with him because he has told me that he will win that um, <laughs> throughout. No, Gavin. Soulless. I mean, <laughs> absolutely soulless eyes. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, Gavin, you caught my attention when we met uh, at a networking event. Um, you know, based on how you really make a difference in e-commerce businesses, just to let us know a little bit about how you got started and what it is that you're doing, um, you know, for uh, e-commerce businesses to actually help them get more sales. Yeah, yeah, totally. So I'll go back to where it all really started. This was a uh, years ago. I was um, I was a stand up comedian, so I do stand up comedy. And basically, transitioning from being a a full time worker, I was working at the government. But before that, I'd, I'd owned a few websites. I'd buy and sell websites. But um, I transitioned from my government job, and I was like, you know what? I want to focus more on stand up comedy. And what was difficult for me was managing a full-time job and doing stand-up when my hours were late, you know, I was spending a lot of time writing. And so what I found was one of my buddies, he was working for a marketing agency and he needed some assistance with the email side of his business. And uh, they were based in the US and, and I had dabbled a little bit in email. You know, I was very, very new to the whole thing, but I said, yep, you know what? I'll do it. It sounds like it's a 10, 15 hour job a week. Fantastic. Cause it allows me to still focus on comedy. It was remote. It allowed me to travel. And so I just went in head first. Right. And so I, I was working there and the great thing was they were super accepting of just, you know, me learning on the ropes. And, and I was essentially getting paid, not very much, to learn how to do email marketing. So I worked with them for a bit. And then as time went on, I then moved over to another agency based out of Australia and uh, just leveled up, really, when it came to email marketing. We were just working with any and all e-commerce brands, direct-to-consumer e-commerce brands based out of New Zealand, Australia, uh, over in the U.S. as well. And then just really just, you know, refined my skills. Once again, was continuously getting paid for to learn. And I kept doing it while pursuing stand-up comedy. And as I got older, you know, I kind of got to a stage where um, I think I fell out of love with comedy. I think I fell out of love just in terms of the lifestyle that surrounded comedy. And as I was doing that, I, I gradually became more and more aware that I just wanted to set up my own thing. And, you know, I was getting to a place with email marketing where I was working hourly and I was doing pretty much everything but the invoicing of the client. And I kind of realized, you know, hey, I'm doing all this work. Why don't I just transition into setting up my own agency, managing my own clients, getting a bit more money? I'm doing all that anyway at the moment. Let's just go for it. And so I uh, I jumped off, right? I was like, you know what? I'm going to I'm gonna work a little bit more with this, with this agency. But while I do that, I'm going to start getting my own clients. And so I started doing a bunch of outreach, getting in touch with a bunch of e-commerce brands. Obviously, there was a non-compete, so I couldn't go for any of the clients that I was working with when it came to the agency. So I had to start from scratch, right? So start from scratch, 
a lot of networking events, which is actually where we met one of the, you know, just event meeting people in person. And, um, and, and then here we are, you know, now, now I run an e-commerce, well, email marketing agency, as well as an SMS. We do a bit of SMS as well. And we specialize in helping direct to consumer brands in the food and beverage industry, make money through the use of email and SMS marketing. Fantastic. That's quite a journey right there. And especially yeah. the fact that you started off in stand-up comedy. Do you think there's some sort of relation in what you are now doing because there's audiences involved, there's an applause involved, there's also some sort of response that happens when you send out an email um, that you're trying to elicit from a customer? And, you know, so my question now is, do you think your past and background has actually helped you to do well in this sort of industry? Sure. I think... My past and my background has has helped me a lot when it comes to just meeting the clients that I ended up working with, right? Now, it allows me to think a bit laterally in terms of, you know, creative thinking when it comes to writing these emails, designing the emails. But I think it shines through most when it's conversations like this, right? When we're jumping on calls, when I'm, when I'm doing my outreach. Um, to do stand-up comedy, I think it takes a lot of, a lot of guts, you know, to, to do a terrible show night after night. <laughs> after night in front of a bunch of people once you kind of go through that ringer um your your sense of pride kind of goes out the window a little bit and it allows you just to be a lot more proactive as long as you know yourself a lot more proactive in how you approach people uh and i'm speaking more from a b2b perspective here as a business owner talking to other business owners i think it's just allowed me to be a lot more uh you know amicable and likable when it comes to these calls that i kind of jump on you know Absolutely. And there's one thing for sure that people buy from those that they know, like, and trust. And if you're really good yeah. at striking conversations and seriously, uh, you know, eliciting a belly laugh from someone that will actually get them to like you um, a little bit more. So what sort of, um, you know, elements do you think are important for somebody who's looking to get started in e-commerce um, sort of uh, email marketing in, when they start their campaigns? Totally. I, I, I love the idea of just learning while uh, through doing, right? You can learn so many, there's, there's so many courses out there when it comes to email marketing, right? And you can, you can go through everything when it comes to writing an email, designing an email, building on a system. Um, but the reality is you go to trial it with, uh, with a live client. And it sounds kind of weird, right? Because it's like at the, at the end of the day, you want to make sure you're doing the best job you possibly can for the clients that you're working with. When you're first starting out, it's, 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 it's hard to do a great job if you don't have the knowledge. And so I think the great thing for me was when I first started, I was working with agencies that were for the most part aware of my capabilities, right? And then they were willing to teach me and willing to give me clients to learn on the ropes with. And then from there, I just increased my skills. And it was on the job learning that really helped me, but it was also doing so in a way that the people that I was providing the service with were aware that I was learning. And I think I'm sure you experience this in your space, especially in my space. There's a lot of, um, it's like sh just sh shitty people who don't know the services that they're selling. You know, they say they sell it. They do contractor arbitrage. They off they outsource the work to somebody completely without having any knowledge on how to implement and how to actually dial in like a, well, a classic email strategy or build a flow. And what ends up happening is you get clients who get burned because they hire an agency and they, you know, then they hire somebody like me. I come in and I'm like, oh my God, all this stuff's been set up incorrectly. You're using just images in your emails. You haven't set up a dedicated center domain your flows are all out of whack they're crossing over your segmentation isn't happening and they get burned right they're like oh god agencies just suck i don't want to use email marketing agencies and it makes us look bad as well like the good ones right where we actually do know what we're doing so i think as long as there's no uh, full circle here as long as you're willing to learn and uh, do practical application uh, of the knowledge but also do so in a way that the person that you're practicing on essentially is aware that that's the case right price your services accordingly if, if, if need be uh or, or you know find like i did find an agency that you can work within and work your way up and, and get the skills from there i love that because you learn to drive by actually driving you don't learn by yeah. you know simulating and you learn to fly by actually flying a plane so how can an e-commerce uh, business really get the most out of um, email marketing to actually increase their sales and grow their customer base? 
Yeah, good, good question. Yeah, I totally hear you. It's it's practical, right? Learn by doing. You know, I I learned to drink not through uh, through watching my dad drink. Anyway, um, let's. <laughs> so basically, I think listen, email is an absolute beast for e-commerce stores. I mean, you know, more often than not, just implementing some basic flows, getting some decent, somewhat okay campaign strategies can increase your total sales or get online store sales to be derived from email by at least twenty percent. So imagine you're doing about ten thousand dollars a month in revenue. If you implement email properly, do some flows, you capture a list, and then you start sending out campaigns. Can typically increase sales by 20%. On top of that, for every dollar that you spend on email, according to Clavia's statistics, which is one of the most popular e-commerce uh, direct-to-consumer email marketing platforms out there, you get about $38 back. Now, you can't get return on investment like that in pretty much any other advertising medium out there. Um, and so it's just one of the best ways to go. Now, if you're first starting out, you're an e-commerce brand, listen, get your, first of all, Step one is actually capture people's email consents, right? Make sure you are building a list. Even if you have no intention of ever sending out an email, and you should build the list because if six months down the road, two years down the road, you're like, hey, you know what? I do want to start doing some email marketing. How good is it that you already have a database of two, five, six thousand people that you can instantly start marketing to versus being like, oh, you know what? I wasted all this time. I could have been building up my database. Get that set up first. Then after that, get some basic flows set up. Flows, what we call email automations. Have a welcome series set up. Have an abandoned cart. Have a browse abandoned and a post-purchase thank you flow. Those are the four core flows that everybody really should have. And then after that, you can start building it out a little bit more to a win-back flow, a cross-sell flow. So cross-sell your products. Also look at a sunset flow. There's a bunch of things. And then also look at capturing SMS consent as well. SMS is going to be an absolute beast in the future. It already is overseas. In Australia, people are slowly catching on. In New Zealand, if you can afford to capture it using Klaviyo, I think it costs $275. But if you're going to make the investment, it'll be well worth it in the long term. Oh, absolutely. And you just brought about so many other different strategies. You talked segmentation. You talked the kind of flows that people need to have and things of that nature. Now, as a email, um, you know, um, email marketing consultant. I mean, I'll put in reference to uh, maybe an accountant. An accountant, when somebody comes to them for the very first time, they bring in a box full of receipts. What is the most common thing that you get when people come to you um, when they start working with you? The reason why I'm asking this question is so that when somebody's listening to the show right now, they can actually tell where they are and actually recognize to say, wait a minute, I'm the guy with the box of receipts that actually needs to start looking at email marketing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great point. I think we get three different types of people that, that come to me. Uh, first one is, I know email marketing is useful. I've tried doing it. I lack the expertise. And big thing, I lack the time. Right. So time, it just it's so time consuming sending out emails, and especially when you commit your get. It's so easy to say, you know what? I'm going to start doing a monthly newsletter to my database. They do the first one, goes pretty good, get some revenue from it. Month two swings around and they're like, ah, shit. You know what? I'll delay it by a week. And then it rolls around. And then month three rolls around. They still haven't sent another campaign. And they realize I don't have enough time to do this. And I'm not really leveraging, uh, you know, fully utilizing the database that I have. Number two, the type of person that really comes in is uh, somebody who says, I, I, you know, I hear emails useful. Don't really know much about it. Would love to learn a little bit more. Absolutely. Fantastic. We can kind of jump in there as well. Number three is somebody who comes in and says, listen, we've been doing email marketing. It's going well for us. And once again, we just want to outsource it. You know, it's going well. We've been burned by an agency in the past, but we just want to, we want to fully outsource the process. And those are usually your bigger clients. Now, a typical process that I kind of go through when it comes to uh, getting a client on board is, is step number one, actually auditing their account. So we have a two, two step process for, for all the flow for the clients that we bring in. Number one is the discovery phase where we just go through what they've done, what they're doing in the past, what they're doing in the future, what their goals are. And then we always ask for access to their current email service provider, whether that be MailChimp, whether it be Klaviyo. We ask for access to that just to see if we can do a quick audit, see what they're currently doing and to check if there's actually value 
that we can add beyond just time saving, right? If they are just saying, hey, we just want to save time, sure, we can take it over. But if they're saying, hey, we want to increase our revenue by 20% and they're already doing 50% of their revenue from email, we need to make sure that there's actually some work that we can do in there, right? So we go in, do the audit, and then from there, we make a series of recommendations. Now, once again, we're, we're in the process of actually trying to productize our service with my agency. So looking at trying to make it the same service regardless of what business you are, as long as you're in the food and beverage industry and you meet a certain set of criteria. Fantastic. Now, Gavin, you know, you would understand, especially as a stand-up comedian, you know, if you mm. throw a joke and then the audience does not respond to it, you've bombed. Or if you uh, have the audience laughing for 10 minutes, then you only have maybe one minute to finish the rest of your set. Now, as an yeah. email marketer, see, how do you actually measure the success of email marketing and what sort of metrics should people be uh, paying attention to just so that you're not everywhere. Like you mentioned, um, you know, in, 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 in one of the answers you gave us. Sure. So, so I'll, I'll speak to this from two different angles for people who have an email database from a B2B perspective, success looks very different from people in the direct to consumer market from an email marketing perspective, right? So in the B2B space, success, I think would look like engagement with your emails. And what does engagement look like? Engagement looks like open rates and click rates on your emails that you're sending out. Now, what percentage that looks like really varies, but I try and get a minimum of 40% open rates from the segments, the emails that we send out, and then also click rates minimum 2%, right? So those are good metrics from a B2B perspective. Now, from a, and, and the reason I distinguish between the two is because obviously B2B, attributing revenue to things like an email in the B2B space is quite hard, right? Especially if the real conversion metric is, is getting somebody on a call. Like I'm sure you're aware, and it's the same with you, man. It's, no one buys your consultancy service by adding it to their cart and then... <laughs> You know, and then being like, it's in my inbox. Fantastic. I can't wait for this to come to the mail. It's a series of steps, right? You're actually through an email, you're selling a call. And in the call, in my case, you're selling a second meeting. And in the second meeting, you're selling the service. So from a B2B perspective, it's really just looking at engagement from that database, right? Now, secondly, from a direct consumer perspective, you're looking at all those same metrics along with conversion rates, right? So what kind of sales are we kind of getting? Because you can easily attribute sales to an email. Now, Clavio and typically in the email marketing space, they have an attribution window. So if somebody takes an action on an email within a period of time, if they make a purchase after that window of time, the attribution set is attributed to that email. Now, typically Clavio recommends five days. So if somebody takes an action within an email, whether that be open or clicking an email, they say any sale that takes place within five days is counted towards the email. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, I think that's, that's pretty fair, to be honest. Uh, you do have to be mindful of some agencies you can change that attribution window. They'll sometimes be like, you know, we're going to change it to 20 days and they don't even tell the client. And what ends up happening is it makes their look work look a hell of a lot better, right? Because let's say Gavin clicks an email and 20 days later, he buys a product. I don't think it's fair to say that the email made me buy that. I think it was something else, right? So you're actually looking at engagement, you're looking at deliverability, and you're looking at the total amount of revenue that you're getting from your email. Fantastic. Now, you keep mentioning Clavio, and obviously there's other uh, sort of uh, systems out there. Now, what's mm. what are some of the maybe latest trends and innovations in e-commerce email marketing, and how can businesses um, stay ahead of the curve? Because I've just been hearing a lot of noise uh, recently about um, the the AI chat GPT. Mm. And is that something that has sort of made its way into uh, the e-commerce um, email marketing space? Yeah. Uh, listen, I, I think, um, first of all, things that are coming into the market that are getting bigger and bigger now is SMS. Like I said before, SMS is becoming a, a big, big mover and shaker. Um, and Clavio integrates that. Now, the reason I mentioned Clavio so much is because, like I said, I work primarily with direct to consumer brands and Clavio is just the email marketing platform for people who sell products online. ChatGPT is absolutely becoming a huge factor within the email marketing space. So uh, I don't know if you heard ChatGPT 4.0 was just released recently. Just yeah, last night so, for those yeah. that have, yeah, yeah. 
and, and and I mean, you get some great levels of, you know, reasoning in there as well. And listen, I, I'd be lying if I said, you know, don't use it for emails. The reality is a lot of copywriters are, are having to pivot quite a bit just because ChatGPT can write a decent, not great, decent email just straight off the bat using that platform. Now, you do have to be mindful when it comes to when it comes to writing these the software. It's never going to be done. Like I'm not going to write it out, done, copy and paste, instantly done. You need to adjust the wording, right? You need to make sure you're reviewing the copy. And, and that's where like a copywriter's oversight comes in. Now, when it comes to email, you, if, from an agency perspective, you are saving money on copywriters nowadays, because instead of getting them to write the whole email, you're actually getting them to review the email, which takes a lot less time because you can just check in a series of emails into ChatGPT. And then from there, you have your copywriters review it to make sure it's the right tone of voice, it contains all of the key points that the client wants. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's really, I, mean, I think in the future it will be there. At the moment, I don't think it really replaces the whole uh, human element of it. I mean, like, you know, ChatGPT can't write a joke right uh, and neither can i but um chat gpt can't write chat gpt can't write a joke just yet and that's like a key factor when it comes to you know the subtle nuances of the human language oh absolutely i mean at the end of the day yes we might have technology but it doesn't uh, usually go all the way. So now you, you really brought up something interesting about copywriting and um, how, you know, the content of the emails is actually crafted. What are some of the best practices for creating compelling email content, such as maybe subject lines, copy, the visuals? And I think that's where maybe an agency would actually uh, play a leading role to make sure that, that those things are in place. Yeah, definitely. I want to say it varies so much from from audience to audience, right? Like there's no hard and fast rules, I don't think, when it comes to, I mean, there's some general rules that you can, you know, send out, like obviously don't send an email out at 1 a.m., you know what I mean? But there are, it, it varies so much from database to database. So what might work for one client might not work for another client. Compelling subject line is key right? You've got to have a good compelling subject line and personalization is key as well. So leverage personalization wherever possible. By personalization, I mean saying stuff like, hi, Gavin, instead of hi there, right? Or hey, mate, say hi, Gavin. And leveraging the information you have about your users in a clear and apparent way really helps with conversions. So adding personalization to the subject line is very, very useful. Short and snappy call to actions tend to work really well as well. Once again, that varies from client to client. I have noticed that uh, in some cases, plain text emails from a commercial perspective do better than ones that have creative elements added onto them, right? There's this really cool client, or not client, sorry, not client of mine, big store called Sticker Mule. I recommend anybody go and check out Sticker Mule. Are you aware of them? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and they send plain text emails. That's that's their whole email marketing strategy. Short, snappy, three, four line plain text emails. And they convert like crazy. They do so well. And I think sometimes people can get confused when they think over designing these emails is the best way to go. And obviously it looks amazing. But you have to keep in mind that uh, it's not for you. It's, it's for the reader, right? And if, if the reader uh, is indicating through the use of testing and data and results that they are resonating more with a plain text variation of an email, you have to be willing to be like, hey, listen, this might not be uh, fully conveying uh, our brand and our imagery in a, in a creative fashion through like, you know, creative elements, but we can do that through uh, tone of voice and everything like that. We should lean more heavily on the plain text emails. The one thing you just brought up about Sticker Mule, I was actually just looking. Um, I have one of their products here, this mm. over here. It's a sticker that I um, created from their um, platform. And it was, cool. it, as you say, three lines. It said, get 20 stickers for $30. And that whole email fit into like the notification settings of my, um, oh. of my phone which meant I got the message, got the call to action of what I wanted to do, went on the website. And two days later, I already had stickers. Now I, I could send you some stickers because I don't know what to do with them based on three lines of text. So you are absolutely um, right when it comes to that. Now, I also find that when people are 
in the e-commerce space, usually their products are seemingly the same. A shirt is a shirt. The pants are pants. Shoes are shoes. Mm. You know, how do people then maybe use email marketing as a tool to really stand out from the competition? Totally. Totally. So I think that comes down to, first of all, actually, and this would almost come out of the realm of email marketing, right? But you need to create a unique USP, you know, what's your unique selling proposition, unique selling point, what, what makes you different. And unfortunately, from an email perspective, it might be kind of hard for us to flesh that out. That's more of a, we can convey what you've already established. Unless, you know, there will be some full suite marketing agencies that can figure that out for you. Um, but from an email perspective, how can we dial in your brand? I think it really comes down once again to personalization and product recommendations on a personal level, right? So obviously, if, if you're a clothing store, for example, and you've bought a shirt, right? If I can figure out the type of shirt that you've bought, right? I can create emails that cross-sell, upsell different types of shirts in a similar category because you've already demonstrated interest within that brand. I can also create different emails that come out 60 days later that say, hey, we hope your shirt's going really well. Have you checked out these new pants that we've that we're that we've that we're currently offering that are a perfect color match for the shirt that you've bought, right? And so this is where segmentation, personalization really comes into the picture. And it works really, really well if you have multiple SKUs. And it works really, really well if you're a big store with a big database because you can really get granular with these recommendations and cross-sell opportunities. Fantastic. I really like how, obviously, uh, for lack of a better example, Amazon, as soon as you put something in a basket or as soon as you yeah. buy something, they start recommending a whole slew of other things. And um, yeah, I obviously have to <laughs> restrain myself from 100%. On, on buying from them. Fantastic. No, given I, I mean, Amazon's a beast, right? Like that's that's the whole thing, right? It's, it's like it's like taking those that series of recommendations that they do on an on platform perspective and implementing them to an email structure. You can absolutely do that. It just takes a lot of work. But here's the thing: if you front load it on the front end, you do all this work on the front end, it'll just generate results. Especially if you automate the process down the road automatically for you. And yes, might be month, two months of heavy lifting at the start, but dude, once you set it up, you're, you're set for years, you know? Ah, uh, fantastic. I really enjoyed our conversation today. And obviously we might just run out of tape, but before we do that, I wanted us to, um, you know, establish connection between you and um, our audience. What would be the best way for uh, people to get a hold of you just so they can maybe continuously learn from you or actually engage you in your e-commerce uh, email marketing services? Yeah, totally. LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the way to go. I put content out three times a week on LinkedIn, both to do with email marketing as well as unrelated stuff as well. But LinkedIn's the way to go. I'm sure there'll be a tag somewhere within this, this video. But yeah, follow me on LinkedIn, Gavin Hewison. Fantastic. Now, at the end of the day, you know, somebody is just sitting here watching and we really have opened up their mind to what is possible when it comes to email marketing. Now, as an expert in this space, what sort of advice would you give to e-commerce businesses that are just maybe starting out with email marketing and looking to establish a strong email marketing strategy? Yeah. Okay. So first port of call is make sure you're growing that list, capture that list, build out some key automations. So automate the welcome series process, create some abandoned cart flows to recover lost sales, browse abandoned post-purchase thank you flow. Number two is segment your database based off of engagement with your emails in the past, right? So create segments of subscribers that are comprising of people who have opened or clicked an email in the last, for example, 90 days and communicate with them directly initially because you want to be able to build up your reputation as a good sender in the eyes of Gmail, Hotmail, Outlook. And when you're sending to people who are engaged, that's going to tell those providers that you're actually a good sender. So segment your database and then just start, right? Because from a campaign perspective, campaigns speak to the flows because if you start generating engagement from your database on your website from campaigns the flows that you set up in the background will then take over the conversation automatically based on the actions that people are taking on your website from a campaign perspective fantastic i mean we could go on and on but that's <laughs> a wrap ladies and gentlemen and thank you so much for tuning in to our episode of the Online uh, Prosperity Show. And a really big thanks to our guest, Gavin uh, Houston, for sharing their valuable insights and expertise with us. Now, I hope you found this uh, episode informative. 
and also the valuable insights that we've brought to you. And I also um, encourage you to subscribe to our podcast and get notified for on the future episodes that we might be having and get access to a great more content like this to help your e-commerce business grow. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time on the Online Prosperity Show. Bye for now.